higher ground. Oh, right. If you can hear me, I'll try to reach you later. Repeat, I'll try to reach you later. Hello. I'm just going to assume you heard that. Welcome back to people who aren't aware. I thought I would do a little bit of a playthrough and a commentary on my experiences of the Path of Fire uh, demo weekend that everybody got to play. If this is part two. If you've missed part one, there'll be a link to that in the description. Uh, if not, then sit back, enjoy. We'll be showing off some other very fun things. I'll give you guys my interpretation of it. This was uh, my taste of Path of Fire, some of the first stuff. We're currently in the north central regions of the new map, and uh, what we're looking at here is the quicksand that you cannot cross unless you have the third mount. So remember, each mount comes in each map, but there'll be stuff to do in earlier maps with them. And this is a great example of that. So we can't cross there, and that rock out in the middle of the quicksand um, is kind of inaccessible to us. Now, there were ways in the demo of cheesing it, as you can see I'm currently attempting. As someone who owns both expansions, I will be able to not only use my mount in the expansion, but also glide. And so I thought I'd try my luck See if it was possible to get over there. I think maybe if I had landed on that rocky outcrop near me, I would have been good, but I never made it. So I quickly popped a TP to a friend uh, to teleport back and uh, very quickly gave up that pursuit. Eventually, it was possible in the demo, and I want to make this clear uh, for posterity and for the future. Um, it was possible in the demo to go and get that by breaking out or by doing certain gliding tricks and techniques. Uh, it was not something that I really spent a lot of time doing, however. So, this is a little Forge space. Uh, you guys remember the official uh, announcement trailer, the reveal trailer of Path of Fire, featured a lot of Forge and Forge bases and stuff. I've actually come to believe a lot of that was right here. A lot of that trailer was in the first map, and a lot of stuff to do with the Forge was this outpost here. Uh, this is not like uh, we see in Ore, or we saw with a lot of Mordrum stuff, where outposts could be cleaned out of all their enemies, and then you'd capture the territory for yourself until eventually it fell again. This is just a Forged place. I don't think there are any events that cycle that allow you to take this for the men and women of Am Noon. Um, you're, you're basically in hostile territory if you're hanging around. Now, there is stuff going on. There's ammunition. There's forged ammunition. I don't know what we would do with that as players. If that's some kind of mechanic or if we can press F on it, pick it up. It's like an environmental weapon and throw it around. I never really got to play with that. Maybe someone has an answer for that in the comments. Uh, but yeah, this was uh, my first experience of killing a lot of forged, sort of when there's a lot of them around. And uh, they, they really weren't too challenging, but hey, I mean, I'm very used to playing this class. I was on the best gear you possibly can and stuff. And uh, I'm sure that when we're first tentatively exploring in our new elite specializations and it feels like we're sort of on a new profession, there'll be uh, stuff going on. Oh, here we go. So we can just plant these explosives. I don't know. Why would I want to plant an explosive? It's not like this is a part of a heart. Maybe later it will be a part of a heart. I'm not entirely sure. I also wouldn't be surprised if this is a part of the story. Uh, so there you'll notice I actually walked on a trap. That's definitely a thing all over the map. Uh, so we walk on the spikes, they came up, they nailed me. I really like that. I like the animations on it. I like the way that it looks. I like the amount of damage and the, you know, the, the, the tuning it's currently got in gameplay. I think it's great and it also spawns enemies when you walk on those traps often. Now what I'm most excited about beyond all of that though is if I think RPG and I think desert experience and I think of, you know, the adventures that we could have in a place like that, I think plundering tombs and traveling inside great ancient pyramids uh, and untouched locations filled with booby traps. And don't you guys think that that's a brilliant little asset for them to have made to maybe reuse later somewhere else in a booby trap style environment? There are some cool booby traps in Guild Wars 2 already. Like some of the jumping puzzles have these swinging logs that bat, uh, you know, batter you and knock you in various directions. We've, we're all very familiar with flame traps and other varieties of spike traps like you see in Aslan catacombs and stuff. Uh, so what if Path of Fire does something like that, like a mini dungeon that is uh, less about combat, but more about plundering some tomb. And it uses all those wonderful assets. I think that'd be excellent. Anyway, that's uh, what struck me as I was playing here initially. You notice I'm getting tons of unidentified gear as I travel around the world here. Uh, that is a mechanic that we've talked about before. In my opinion, generally speaking, it does save on inventory space. It's funny because one of the first big uh, sort of community outcries or discussion centers when this came out, on Reddit at least, was people noticing that identified gear didn't fully solve Inventory Wars 2 and inventory management, but I think a lot of people had misconceptions at that time And we still at this point really need to be able to play the full expansion to get a proper hands-on and uh, Find a sound opinion on it. 
Um, but so yeah, here we got the quicksand again. There's a little signpost that says danger quicksand or something. You'll notice there's some skimmers floating around. It was at this point I realized that that sand fall, that waterfall of sand or whatever, uh, wasn't hiding a cave or something, which I thought in the past. And here, look on that cliff, we get a fire gin. Uh, with the tag elemental armor, so I was incredibly shocked and excited to see Jin in the demo uh, These were excellent Guild Wars 1 enemies very fun the Guild Wars 2 visual design of them I actually don't like as much as the GW1 ones um, But I was so excited about fighting these the thing is you're not supposed to be able to get there to get into combat with these Jin unless you have more mounts than just the Raptor it's really not designed. Oh, I, I actually, I, I apologize. I, I, I'm telling a lie. You can get there on the Raptor. You just need the very long jump on the Raptor. Um, I really wanted to get there. So here we got a, a short little jump we can do across that broken bridge, which is very fun. Uh, but there is no real way to get to those gin without also breaking the game, which I did ultimately do, but won't appear in this video. Putting the gin on hold. Here's something else really badass. I can still make them light up. Want to play the old memory game for old time's sake? The old memory game for old time's sake. So this is another hero challenge. Uh, and what, uh, sorry, this is a mastery insight. So we won't be doing this daily. What this is, is this is a reference that any Guild Wars 1 player will recognize. In GW1, in the Crystal Desert, which is the region of the world we're in right now, um, there were all these pyramid uh, sort of structures and these old forgotten, uh, presumably made by the forgotten, uh, teleporter pads. The sequence I light up for you. And the pattern completes repeated by touching the switches in the same order. And to activate them, to legitimately, in Guild Wars 1, you'd use them to traverse the, the desert. To activate them, you had to run up to a pedestal, interact with it, and you had to play a sort of mini game. So, uh, you would have these um, six things, and this is here in Guild Wars 2 again, and they'll light up. And as they light up, you're supposed to press F. So, I messed that up. Watch the sequence I light up for you. The pattern completes repeated by touching the switches in the same order. And so there you go, you see that light come up. Uh, and it's our job to look at the sequence. So middle right, bottom right, top left, uh, I think that was, and then top right. Uh, and then we, uh, we're supposed to mimic it. And you've got to do three rounds of this. And in GW1, so there I messed up again. In GW1, this was something you do to actually open up teleporters and travel around quite quickly. Uh, I was really hoping to see some kind of reference to it in the second game. And well, they did it. This was so hype for me. Uh, it will be randomized each time and they'll get more difficult as you go along. So this time I think I should succeed. I think the Guild Wars 2 version of it is a bit harder because the light has got so much bloom on it and it's so wide. Uh, it's not as clear as the Guild Wars 1 equivalent, but little references and stuff like this is what I live for. And I was super thrilled to see this. Uh, this, of course, gives us a mastery point. So in Guild Wars 2, it's no longer about exploration. We've got mounts for exploration and we've got gliding and we've got all this other stuff. So I don't begrudge the devs for that, but I do think the mastery point would have been slightly cooler if we, instead of just getting it instantly, oh god, look at how terribly I'm doing this. I think it would have been slightly cooler if instead of getting the mastery point instantly, we actually opened the teleporter up. And then we got to go into it to collect the mastery point from some remote buried location where the exit teleporter is, I don't know. Oh, so I guess I actually did so badly at this on my first time, I just gave up and moved on. Eventually, I did go back and do it, I promise, guys. Uh, so here we have this beautiful pillar here as well on the left with the kind of Reaper, hooded Reaper-looking characters. Uh, those as well appeared in GW1, but their texture was way less impressive. Their size was way less impressive. These look so cool, it makes me desperately wonder who crafted them, what they represent. Are these supposed to be forgotten here, just robed forgotten? Honestly, it reminds me a bit of the Legend of Grimrock as well, those of you who followed those series of mine uh, a little while ago. Uh, so yeah, I loved this as well. It was like so obvious that the devs looked at the Crystal Desert GW1 and they rebuilt this stuff. Absolutely stunning assets. Uh, moving further forward, here we get the hero challenge itself. I think it's just some kind of big boss fight. Um, and again, we might be doing this very frequently. And uh, in just a moment, you'll see how to get up to the gin or how we're supposed to be able to. But it will also be your first example of me hitting a mastery gate, right? Like something you should be able to do, but I haven't trained the raptor enough to be able to do it. And speaking of masteries, actually, as well, as we commune this, you will notice that my experience for getting up to tier three uh, or tier two, that is, is already done. 
again. So anyone who never played Heart of Thorns doesn't quite understand the mastery system or how much XP grinding you have to do. There's really so little. I mean, this was a matter of minutes. I haven't even been paying attention to my experience bar. It's up again. And I haven't even been using any boosters. Don't forget the stuff like fireworks. Uh, there are birthday boosters. Uh, you get tons of boosters if you use the gem slot. It's just, uh, you know, it, it's going to be really a non-issue as far as I can see right now. Um, so, so yeah, here we get this slope. Uh, there are some interesting enemies over there. There's a Hydra. I've talked a lot about the Hydra on my channel already, so maybe we don't have to geek out too much. Excellent enemies from the first game, which for the first time have reappeared in the sequel. As you d uh, attack them, you can chop their heads off. Uh, the heads will flail around and fight you, but they'll be bleeding to death and they'll eventually succumb to it. They cast this ability on aggro meat. Meteor, and um, they're a bit squishy, I think, depending on the build that you're using to fight them. Look, they get that triple flamethrower attack. That's really sexy as well. Uh, the developers actually said in some recent live streams, I believe, that the Hydra almost didn't even make it into the expansion. They almost didn't even make it into the expansion. They really rushed to make them a thing. And God, they did such a gorgeous job. I'm so happy that they really took the time to crunch them in. Uh, I would have been really disappointed if there were no Hydra here. Uh, those who have been playing the game and following the most recent Living World episodes, we got to go to another region of the world recently, the Fire Island Chain, as a part of a free update. And uh, I was hoping for Hydra there and was very disappointed when they didn't arrive. Uh, but uh, at least they're here in the expansion. So check it out. There they, we've got a huge gap. Look at that massive jump. Even with our Raptor, and there are those beautiful sexy gin on the other side, uh, and WDC. Even with our Raptor as it currently stands, we couldn't make that jump. So we have to teach the Raptor to jump further, and then we can. Anyway, so yeah, we did have that DC. Um, so I, I re-logged, did a couple of things. This is where we logged back in, uh, just near the Hero Challenge. Uh, the demos were doing that. I guess I'll mention this, just so that people way off uh, in the future uh, know this. The demos did DC every now and then. The devs did push quite a few little patches during them. Uh, these weren't necessarily stress tests. Uh, stress tests came later and also had their own like little lag things which you'd expect uh, But there were a couple of little disconnects that were happening uh, when this was open to the public um, So yeah, uh, there we get to fight some more Hydra as well And that's kind of what that that area is right if we could make that jump We'd go to a special little temple over there. Uh, here you got the um, Hydra has got some feeding buff on it. I'm not quite sure what feeding means. Uh, maybe if I pause the video, I'd be able to see a little bit closer. Uh, but yeah, just there's a lot of quality on them, right? The only thing I don't like about the Heart of Thorns mobs right now is it feels like, one, they are a bit squishy maybe, but two, um, they also don't really have any break bars hooked up to them. Maybe they will in the future, but it seems like more than anything, the devs use break bars to make enemies immune to crowd control rather than to introduce interesting mechanics for crowd control which they did more of with Heart of Thorns I love break bars, I just want to see them be used a little bit more uh, but there you go, so uh, we also kill a veteran eel this was uh, again another border of the demo, so what you've watched me do now is start off go north and basically scrape the northern wall of the demo map all the way from the pyramids in the corner at the coast, past the quicksand and the quarry and then all the way over here, we're now in the next corner of the demo. There is more of the first starting map. There is, and it's over this uh, hill here. If you look over that hill, then you can see uh, actually the entrance to the second map of the expansion. And you can see parts of the brand and a massive shattered pyramid and stuff. But you're not actually allowed to explore those uh, as of the first demo, unfortunately. Because, as you can see here, I haven't quite realized, and then boom. Oh, you're leaving the demo area? No! I find it interesting that they dismount us when leaving the demo area. Uh, of course, sneaky Pete that I am, I figured, hey, what if we just go along the top of this cliff? Maybe we can get somewhere that the devs don't want us to. Because the boundary seemed a bit arbitrary on this one. With the Heart of Thorns demo, it felt like the boundaries were like really carefully and clear-cut thought out. And they actually went so far as to add these massive vine walls obscuring our vision and our ability to see various uh, areas upcoming. On this demo, they didn't seem to have put that effort in. They just, you know, carved out a chunk of the map we can explore and couldn't and put these barriers here. And that was it. Uh, so yeah, you'll notice that we can come along the top of this cliff. There is a flax, flax gathering node there. Uh, that means one thing at least, that flax isn't going to be a purely Heart of Thorns based thing. Uh, flax is mostly used with scribing recipes, obviously, and there is a new guild hall, but a lot of that stuff is staying Heart of Thornsy based. Uh, for example, you cannot claim the new guild hall unless you also own Heart of Thorns. Uh, but it's nice to see that they've at least got those nodes in there. 
Uh, down there, we've got Jacarandas, or Jessarandas, I'll never know how to say the name properly. Uh, those are the... No, they're not the only ones in the demo, but uh, they were the first ones that I saw, and I can't really fight them just yet because they're out of bounds. Uh, there we got a cluster of herbs, and there, if you look on the left right now, you will see a portal to the second map behind a closed gate. The fact it's behind a closed gate there is really interesting to me. So, those that don't know, in Guild Wars 1... At the original release, they gave us a massive open world that you could explore everywhere, freely, whenever the hell you wanted, however the hell you wanted. And they never put any restrictions on it. But after that, with the Factions release, with the Nightfall release, and to a lesser extent, but still true, with the Eye of the North release, with all of those, they said, no, you have to complete story to explore. And what that meant was that the story could be more integrated into exploration, right? So Nightfall, as the story progresses, uh, you know, demons are breaking into the world. So as you travel further around the world, demons start appearing and they can do that and it will make sense. Uh, and they always used to have portals that were covered by gates. And the only way that the gate would open was once you got to a certain part of the story. And what I'm seeing here in Path of Fire is super reminding me of that back in the first game. And I wonder if they're going to do something similar just so that the exploration feels natural and to get people to do a bit more of the story. Um, maybe people wouldn't begrudge them so much here in 2017 doing something like that. Because a lot of people who play Guild Wars 2 these days are doing it for at least one pass through that experience. Uh, so here we got scarabs. These were the first scarabs I saw. I loved these guys too So one of my hopes for the expansion was a sort of an equivalent to pocket raptors from heart of thorns Which are kind of this awful dangerous scary annoying enemy But they they're an interesting thing to fight in terms of build craft and the way you use your skills and how scary they are I love pocket raptors for that. I think they're an interesting enemy I wanted to see sort of a parallel to them in path of fire and what better to have swarms of beetles or scorpions or whatever uh, that did this, uh, but it doesn't seem the devs have done an equivalent, but scarab beetles do exist And you can see them up on these cliffs these mountains Which will be much more comfortable traveling around on once we have the second mount and uh, I guess especially the third So we're now on our way south. Uh, this is sort of doing a perimeter of the demo uh, borders, I suppose uh, It's still the middle of the night. Uh, some of the areas we're currently stood are absolutely stunning in, in day as well uh, and I, I think what I'm hoping to do is to get out of combat right now so that I can mount so that I won't take any fall damage as I fall I mean, I've got a glider so it doesn't matter anyway, but I kind of want to jump down on the rapture And I think that's what I'm trying to do or maybe not that at all And I'm trying to go somewhere completely different. Also look at how interesting that tree is there that style of tree Cutting ahead just a little bit because we probably don't want to be watching us kill scarab beetles. Uh, here we go. I guess I just glide down in the end. Never mind then. Uh, you can see a giant temple in the background there. That temple is sort of the middle of the map in full. Uh, it's actually the temple of Cormir according to concept art names and the POI I believe that's there. But we can't visit it. Uh, here I unfogged a section of the map called Elona Reach, which again we're not supposed to be able to visit. Uh, but Elona Reach is a very weird one to me. Elona Reach is weird because... In Guild Wars 1, Ilona Reach was the name of an entire map. So you know how in Guild Wars 2 we're in the Crystal uh, Oasis right now, and it's an entire map. Ilona Reach was an entire map, oh, it was basically a mission actually, uh, with an entire map associated with it. And I think of it as this huge area of the game, a massive, massive area of the world. Uh, and now to see it in Guild Wars 2, with all the mobility that's now available, afforded to us by mounts and so on, it's really weird to think of how small uh, Ilona Reach will end up being, and how much smaller the Crystal Desert's going to feel. Not because there's less content necessarily, or it's worse than the first game, but just because we move that much faster. Uh, so here is uh, one of my favorite NPCs from the whole demo. I'm really looking forward to seeing all the NPCs that are like this. Uh, this is a Mirage. Uh, this is one of the new elite specializations that come into the game. And this is a member of the Mirage's order or, you know, one of these uh, actual characters that explains their presence in the world and what they do and why they do it. There's some really cool little details there like, hey, we don't like dodge rolling because it gets sand in our clothes. And, well, we've learned how to use mesmery magic to no longer have to dodge. Um, uh, that's maybe a bit of a weird one, but this is very exciting to me. I like the way they describe why they use axes, how it supports their nomadic lifestyle. Uh, there are two such NPCs we can meet, kind of, in this demo. Uh, there was this one, and also in an event in sort of the middle of the demo area. Not the full map. The middle of the full map is, is probably that temple we're looking at there, or thereabouts. Uh, but in the, in the middle of the demo area, which therefore is more to the west of where we're currently looking, uh, there's a hollow smith. Uh, who talks a little bit about Hollis smithing activities and participates in uh, whatever that event was. Also, just behind that mirage, you'll notice that there was another one of those long bridges that you need the extra long raptor leap to be able to uh, cross the gap. 
I love the lighting on these torches here. Remember, there is no actual post-processing going on, on on this footage right now. Uh, or extra post-processing. Uh, this is just the Guild Wars 2's default stuff. And I love the warm glow that they managed to achieve, contrasted with the night. Uh, it means that the outposts and things like this look very different later. Anyway, so here's the Northern Way Station. Lots of Cavaliers here. Again, these Way Stations remind me a bit of the uh, Lion Guards outpost across the Lion's Road. Uh, I never spent too long on this footage exploring this area. But I believe there's another scout. And that scout talks about the Temple of Cormier. And some of the stuff a bit deeper in the map that we shouldn't really be able to experience. Uh, this Char character I liked the look of for some reason. I don't know. He just struck me that his outfit and the way he was uh, sort of dressed on the back Welcome of the mount. Oh, here we go. Station on the northern road to the Crystal Highlands. Balthazar's army arrived here only recently, but they're already causing mayhem and spreading misery. The temple of Cormier in nearby town of Kuali struggled to care for refugees of the warfare despite constant attacks. If you're looking to explore, there are dunes to the south and ruins to our north. Take care if you stray from the road. So that town of Kuali he mentioned, I believe was how he pronounced it, and we were actually looking at very briefly a moment ago. There are some other interesting uh, little things to see. There's a very dark room here. Another stable with mounts at. Stables don't have any mechanical focus in Guild Wars 2. Uh, not unless there's something extra tacked onto the mount system we don't know about just yet. And honestly, I don't think I have too much more to say about this place. Except on top of that tower, you'll notice that kind of weird magical glow. So this is the story... Uh, after you do the initial instance, you can wander around the Crystal Desert and find small high ground places to press F and try to communicate with Timey. Uh, but during the demo, whenever you do this, Timey can't get to the phone, so to speak. And she says, oh, please try again later. I think there were two or maybe three different voice acted lines of dialogue that you could possibly trigger by going to those. And there were maybe four or five of them dotted around the desert. Uh, I'm interested in that, not just because that's what they did in the demo, but as just a function of doing the story when the expansion itself comes out. One thing I loved that Heart of Thorns did very well with its story, limited in scope as it was, it did this beautiful thing of inter integrating the plot into the open world that Living World Season 3 has done very well on as well. So I wouldn't be surprised if, when we're doing this expansion content, we'll have that system come up quite frequently. Where we do an instance and then we sort of explore the map, finding uh, little areas like that to press F on and get some insight from Timey or whoever else maybe that's in the area. Moving on, uh, for I'm not quite sure why I spent so long looking at that tower. Uh, here we got the Vista as well. Uh, that gives us a bit more of a sweeping shot over to the temple, I think? Uh, or, no, yeah, this towards the temple. So this is where we spoke to the Mirage. You could actually see a bit of pop in there. And that's the little town that uh, was referred to a second ago uh, with hopefully some interesting things going on. So you'll notice the other thing about that story thing, right? Is to actually get all the way up there. We can't do that right now. Again, unless we get the mount that lets us jump higher. Which is sort of a map 2 thing, so that's kind of funny. Unless there was a jumping opportunity I didn't know about. Here we get to kill the poor raptor again. We get knocked off. We get that little bit of a, a, a CC on us. Come down into these shallow waters. There's a priestess of Cormier. First one we've met, but there's actually quite a lot. She says, may Cormier guide you. I'm gathering up supplies to be carried across the desert to a refugee camp. Uh, there are a lot of priestesses of Cormier around. Uh, lots of pink moa as well. The new arid dolly axe we were looking at a second ago there. We've got this scaffolding of which we could have been perched on top. Uh, ancient sapling. There are new types of trees that we can harvest in the expansion, but the wood that comes from them is the same, you know, kind of wood, ancient wood, elder wood, and stuff like that. They haven't, like, added a new variety. I've been always curious about that, whether they should add another kind of ore, like something, another type of T5 ore, for example, like mithril or something. I don't know how that would work with crafting and so on. Uh, here we get a little forged ambush and another one of those traps that I talked about earlier. I actually dodged my way through it in the middle of an updraft there, my dagger five. So it never hurt me, and that was quite fun to do. And we get all of these forged soldiers, get to see a little bit of what they, uh, what their combat stuff is like. And largely uninteresting on small patrols. So that's another thing about this map. All over you get these forged patrols moving around, forged ambushes that you want to sort of watch out for, or hunt down to get rewards. And, uh, and yeah, so that's kind of the, the, the night time. At that point, I think I turned off the demo for a few minutes, maybe to go get a snack or something. Came back moments later. 
uh, and the sun had risen and it was back during day. So this was just a couple of minutes later and uh, I waypointed back to Am Noon, an area that I really hadn't explored very much of yet, but has so many cool little details uh, that I wouldn't experience for much later, like uh, an awakened selling statues of Palawa Joko and all the little vultures that are high up and the jumping puzzly things you can do on top of the pyramids. Uh, generally lots of fun stuff. Here I'm going south though, uh, checking out more of the watery areas. Uh, here, this is the place that it looked like, if you watched my previous uh, playthrough of the demo video, I talked about this, it looked like the devs are thinking of doing a heart, but then they didn't. So they've got problems with the water pipes at that event. I can't help but look at this and remember 2012 Guild Wars 2 Queensdale, it's opening, you know, the opening Crichton map had an event about, uh, you know, uh, issues with water pipes. We've got that here. That affects a lot of the town, though. Like, loads of ambient dialogue will refer to water being scarce and there being issues and even conspiracies to do with the water. Uh, and you can go do that event. So that's kind of like what we saw in 2012, where they tried to make the impact of dynamic events in their current state really far-reaching. Uh, the event itself is weird as well, though. You've got to kill, like, ooze, and then the ooze drop globs of, like, gunk that you can then throw at the pipes to seal it up. But it scales very oddly, and it's not too good. Uh, interestingly, you just caught a very brief glimpse of a boat sailing out, uh, floating out on the water uh, that is an exclusive area you can only access if you buy the deluxe or higher version of the expansion. And it's got a ton of services and quality of life features in it for players. But the boat you're actually looking at there has been revamped since the demo and will end up being very different to the one that we've actually got. So that's cool. This was one of my favorite experiences from the demo. And especially in terms of like the mastery system and mounts. What are we looking at here, guys? What we're looking at is an island out in the water, pretty distant from the rest of the map. And there's a beautiful, exotic looking, lovely cove back there. But the question is, how do we get into the island? I love the way this place looks. I love everything about how it's been designed. How do we get in there? Well, the only way is with a skimmer. Only the skimmer can allow you to hover above the water and then jump up with enough height to be able to get in there. Uh, and in fact, they even put this NPC right here who talks about skimmers. And the NPC uh, talks about how they also want to get into this cove because, uh, you know, it's got rich fish or whatever in there. Uh, so breaking out of the map uh, is possible and you can get there. And I did do that during the demos, uh, which reveals there is a very secluded little family of fishers, I think it is, uh, in that location who are reaping the benefits of it. Uh, because no one else can get there. No one can get to all that premium game. Uh, but yeah, this is totally sealed off. So here, I actually take the time to swim all the way around the island just to see. You know, is there another way to get in? And aside from, you know, blatantly glitching the game and unfortunate things like that, this is a, this is an interesting experience. So, we won't be able to come here until we do the story, get to the next map, do more story, get to the third map, get the, the skimmer itself, and then potentially teach the skimmer how to do its special ability well enough to, to get up there. And then we can return all the way back here to where we started and have this extra place we can go to. That's the kind of exploration I really like in games, especially RPGs, and uh, I'm glad that the devs have given it to us so well. Even better than that, though, once you get into the cove, you can then use the jumping mount to get above that cave, and there's even more stuff going up there. Uh, there's like... Um uh, scarabs and stuff. Here, way out in the bottom left corner, you'll notice that we've got a bunch of clams. Uh, not quite sure why they've done clams. Perhaps these are going to have, you know, mussels are going to be in some of the new recipes. Go invest, guys. Ooh. Uh, this reminds me a bit of one of the flax spots that the devs put in Heart of Thorns. Uh, and I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there were clam-based food recipes in the new expansion, right? Uh, you also saw earlier a school of fish. I never talked about that. Or maybe about three minutes ago. Uh, there were a school of, what were they? Were they piranhas? Were they salmon? What were they? But they actually swim around together. That's something we hadn't seen the devs doing properly before. Those fish as well are really violent and aggressive. If you attack them, they will even flop out of the water and try to pursue you on land. And they're really deadly. Uh, so someone had fun, obviously, implementing those. And that, again, is sort of a, a Another area that the expansion has pushed the envelope and in an underwater area as well, which we probably wouldn't expect. Here we get a kind of Lion's Archie feeling experience. Uh, if you guys recall, in Guild Wars 2's Lion's Arch, you can swim out into the water and you can go to a point of interest called Old LA. And in Old LA, that's actually the Guild Wars 1 area that is now uh, flooded and uh, sent under the waters. Well, the similar thing here happened at Amnoon. Uh, the original Amnoon Oasis, which was a big town outpost, 
in Guild Wars 1, that is also submerged. I wonder whether this is also, you know, justified in lore because of the rising of ore. I didn't see any explicit mention to that. But, uh, and I also wonder whether we get more details as well about who came and rebuilt Lines are, um, Amnid Oasis, sorry. Uh, but if you check it out here, look, we actually do have a mastery insight uh, for the Crystal Desert. And, uh, and this POI, this is the original Amnoon Oasis, supposedly, that we're swimming around over. Honestly, I don't really recognize the architecture from TW1. So maybe what we're seeing here is Guild Wars 1 happens, we leave, because we're only there for such a brief period of time in Guild Wars 1. Then people come and they build all this wonderful stuff, then all rises, everything floods, and then it gets rebuilt again or something. And so what we're looking at are ruins that weren't even necessarily there in TW1 either. But yeah, this is, uh, this is sunken... Um, Amnoon Oasis, and it, it seems to be a town that's had a hell of a lot of problems. You'll notice bleached bones down there too. And of course the POI that I'm now unfortunately swimming away from. And hopefully I'll go for it. There we go, I've seen it. So we'll go over and uh, we'll grab that. So this is kind of par for the course for underwater. I really don't have much more to say to you. Uh, my experiences here were the entirety of my experience, you know, within the first hour of playing the demo. And, um, you know, it's not like I think any of us are expecting them to do a lot of crazy stuff. And the other thing I think is very curious, okay, is with the demo, a patch came into the game, just before the demo, that adds a little visual effect to skills on our skill bar while we're underwater. And skills that cannot be used have this, like, teardrop icon and then, you know, a little cross and a wave thing. Now, you're, if you look at my skill bar right now, I have that on my mount. My, I cannot mount right now because I can't do that underwater. I cannot ride the raptor while I'm underwater. And they put that little bit of, that little detail on there. So I really, one thing that struck me while playing underwater there, now that we're in a world where mounts exist, I'm really excited to see an underwater mount. Whatever that would be, I don't know. But I'm really excited to be able to like cling onto the back of a shark or something as it rockets me around underwater. And they can play with underwater in an interesting way there. You know, I think that Path of Fire represents an extra new thing to be excited about when we think of the prospect of an underwater heavy expansion. Uh, and I say underwater heavy. I don't think they'd ever do a pure underwater one. That's crazy. Uh, but yeah, like being able to unlock an underwater mount in that kind of theoretical X back in the future, that would be very cool. Uh, so here we got lots of uh, boats that are docked at Amnoon. I'm not sure whether I have footage of it right now, but uh, one of them is actually a consortium ship. Uh, so the consortium do feature here, and there's an event to go gather cargo that f that's sort of been strewn about the bay. In fact, maybe I am about to see it. There's also a boat uh, carrying packed forces, and specifically Dermond Priory, who have come and they're interested. Yeah, here we go. So I'm actually going to trigger it. These guys have caught some, ma uh, some massive fish, and they've got it strung up. Uh, we've got some cavaliers that are mounted. I'll never get I'll, tired of seeing uh, mounted NPCs. No questions. But here's here we got the consortium, and hopefully I, I will uh, demonstrate some of the dialogue here. Uh, why they are interested in this region of the world? I don't know whether that's going to become a major story beat. Can my family work aboard your ship in return for passage to Crida? I'm afraid that's not possible. This is purely a cargo vessel. Oh, but there must be room in your hold. I've been watching you unload cargo all day. I'm sorry, but our liability insurance doesn't extend to passengers. I'm sure you understand. Liability insurance. Oh, these guys are... I really love the consortium. Here we get the event. Uh, your outlander friends have polluted our harbor. Can you at least recover their cargo for us? And we say, well, we're not a friend of the consortium. Hurry up and get that cargo unloaded. Who is responsible for this mess? Well, uh, hi there. I'm the brand ambassador assigned to this consortium outreach project. How can I help you? Outreach... Ambassador? Is that your ship at the bottom of our harbor? Yes, we did experience a minor setback. At no loss of life, I want to point out. Even so, you're responsible for cleanup. Your cargo is already attracting dangerous sea creatures and blocking our port. Oh, I'm afraid we're simply not staffed for a salvage operation at this time. I don't have the workers to clean up your mess. I'm hearing you, and I assure you we do sympathize with your plight. Uh, he can sound more sarcastic and more insincere. Uh, then we're actually getting some examples of the new voice acting talent. The devs talked on a recent stream about how they hired a cast of new people more fitting for this region of the world. And I think we're even hearing uh, some someone new doing that Asura character's voice right there. And this is another one of those little things that makes the game feel just that bit more fresh. Here I go for the bleach bones, I guess. And now that the event is triggered, you'll see we've got tons of consortium cargo containers. Uh, and we've only got 10 minutes to collect them all. Uh, the end of this event is actually really disappointing, so we're going to skip ahead here 
And I'll just show you guys what it looks like when it's complete. Because who wants to watch underwater combat anyway, am I right? And in the meantime here, I was showing off some of the dyes uh, and playing around with them. Imperial Red, as I mentioned earlier, I think looks really good. On behalf of the Council of Amnoon, to fund the cleanup of our harbor. You are, of course, welcome to keep any of the Consortium's wares that you manage to salvage. Consider them free samples. Huh. Perhaps next time you won't be so reckless. And there we have it. So that's the story of the Consortium. Is that everything we will get from them in the expansion? I wouldn't be surprised if it was, uh, but there you go. Uh, I don't think that branches out into anything specific or different. Uh, and if you try to interact with the guys a little bit later, you really don't see anything more. Um, so yeah, there, there I was mousing over on the map the boat I mentioned earlier, the Lily of the Ellen. Hopefully I've got some footage of me walking over to it. But for now, there are definitely more fun areas of the city to check out. So here I, I put on an Endless Codan tonic. People not following Guild Wars 2 very closely might not know about these. There are now Endless Tonics you can use in combat so you can explore the world. Uh, so I wanted to be a polar bear running around the desert. How cool would that be? But you can't use mounts while in tonic forms, even if they are endless tonics. And I think that's real shame. Uh, and I just verified that there. Here we've got the Amnoon, the people of Amnoon worshiping the gods. And uh, out of them, the Balthazar statue has a basket on its head. This is now quite famously well known in the community and everyone saw this and enjoyed it and I've seen it shared a about a thousand times so everyone knows about the basket on Balthazar's head. But uh, when I first saw this and I first experienced this without ever hearing about it on the internet beforehand, uh, I really, really enjoyed it. So of course in the story right now, Balthazar has come back and nobody likes him. So they've, they've thrown a basket on his head, they've given him some googly eyes and uh, I don't know, maybe even some of the NPCs in the area have got like some cool little dialogue as they walk over. I love this like sapphire gemmy kind of floor with the, the water trickling around it. I've probably tried more times than I should admit in Minecraft to make my houses emulate that kind of look with lapis and water and stuff. And there I fail miserably to get a vista that quite obviously is not that difficult to get. Uh, in fact, any of the mounts we uh, earn in this expansion would be really easy to get over there. Um, like, we've got the Raptor Leap. I think probably the Wolf can teleport over there. The Skimmer can probably do it. Even the uh, Springer can do it. Uh, but we do get this, again, gorgeous look over the bay. I feel like even though these are new vistas in new areas, I'm always so tempted to click skip, but I mustn't do that. I, I want to play for more than just the rewards. I want to do more. So, uh, so yeah, anyway, we get this vista here. And uh, I've also found it very fun in the expansion. If you guys noticed and been struck by this too, as we're talking to the consortium or getting vistas and stuff, just seeing other people riding around on their raptors. Here we've got an example of a uh, aggressive vulture that actually attack us, as I mentioned before. That kind of poo ability that they're using, that poo strike as they drop stuff down. We have seen before there are some like risen vultures in ore, I think it was, and especially one of the jumping puzzles in ore that did something similar. It was just very rare in the game before and we hadn't seen much of. Um, but again, like look at the verticality, right? Anywhere you look where it feels like, oh, should I climb this? Can I climb this? Is there going to be anything there? Nearly always the answer is yes, there is going to be something there. It just might be a bit tricky on a raptor. Here, you'll notice I had an environmental weapon equipped, the lightning hammer. And when I mount, the environmental weapon doesn't despawn. Uh, so this was another thing. I remember being curious about this with gliding. Uh, and they actually have sort of hooked it up onto the mount. So now it's despawned. But uh, it does actually go onto the back, as you saw there. It looks a bit weird because it was sort of floating in the air. Uh, and I think it could have been handled a bit better. But generally, I like it. Uh, warrior banners will appear if you're if you're a warrior holding a banner and then you get on your mounts. It will be there. Uh, I don't know whether it will continue to pass this active effects out on you. It will probably strip those away. But uh, I think that's a nice added thing that you get on mounts. And, um, you know, there's a wide range of different environmental weapons we can hold. Maybe I want to hold a jar of bees and see that strapped onto my raptor's pack as I travel around. Uh, that That's uh, always going to be fun to see. Here we got the Amnoon Southern Outskirts. This is the area with the pipes, with the potential hearts. We notice uh, that the event can actually be triggered. We can talk to Pipeline Inspector Zayna, at which point she'd presumably trigger it and ask for help. Now, bounties, remember, can spawn around the map, and this is one of the places that bounties can exist. During one of the stress tests, I was fighting a big plant boss here. Uh, who will only spawn very periodically. Not too much more interesting going on here, but I will show you the Lily of the Ellen uh, a little bit closer up. There you go. That's the Lily of the Ellen right there as we get this uh, 
uh, tree, and uh, that's now been redesigned. So this is the original design of the Lily of the Ellen. Uh, we can take a quick look at this before waypointing back to the center of town and seeing what we've got uh, going on up here. So next, actually, I've got something very fun to demonstrate for you all, uh, which people found out in the early demo, and I'm surprised not more people ever remembered. Uh, and that is the Bobblehead Tonic. So there are bobblehead labs you could drop down in the game from years ago now, from Living World Season 1. And what it does is it puts a, a funny effect on the game where the head of your character and the head of enemies and everything uh, blows up. And not only do they get much bigger, it's like big head mode, common in a lot of games. Not only does it do that, but they also bounce around like bobbleheads uh, in quite a hilarious way. That is true for your mounts too, and people quickly realize this. So I'm going to take a small sip of the bobblehead lab here. We're going to drink it. And uh, check out what our raptors look like in bobblehead mode. This, I'm expecting, will still be here on the actual expansions release. So if you guys want to make your raptors a lot bigger, or any of the mounts a lot bigger, do be sure to look out for a bobblehead laboratory. And now that that's been placed on the ground by us, any player can go and drink from that. Uh, truly hilarious. It reminds me so much more of now playing like a chicken or some kind of bird as we're riding around on this guy. Uh, but yeah, if you if you feel like the dye channels don't give you enough differentiation in the customization of your character, uh, then well, hey, maybe you can give him a big head and uh, what you dye will be a little bit more noticeable now. Uh, but yeah, so we're now on this monstrous creature, I think for maybe five minutes if you uh, just take a sip and then it will run out. We won't have to worry too much. I think at this point if a race was available I would have shown you a race but there's not one. So just walked out and uh, it's around about now. There's still a heart I haven't done and there's lots of little bits of map completion I haven't done. It's around about now that I started to realize oh god I've actually explored a lot of the demo uh, and you guys at this point really you've seen a lot of what the Path of Fire demos had available. A huge amount of play space we've traveled across. Enormous. You know what you've actually watched me travel through is honestly about the size of uh, any of the Heart of Thorns maps, a lot of play space we have traveled, but it feels kind of s a lot smaller and quicker just because we've been doing it on the back of a mount a lot. System. I didn't tell you this, but they've been shaking Hazim down for protection money. He's refusing to pay? Is he crazy? Wait, the old chief just disappeared. <gasps> now you're getting it. I recommend staying clear of Chief Hazim unless he decides to pay up. How will we know when that happens? If the sabotage suddenly stops, You'll know. So there's a little bit more of the ambient dialogue. There's a lot, honestly. And if you guys, uh, this is my general advice always for Guild Wars 2. But take your time with it, right? Really take your time and make sure that when you see NPCs, stick about just for a little bit just to see what they're talking about. Because I get the feeling that especially with the Amnoon Oasis here, there's going to be a, a lot of backstory and conspiratorial stuff and details that you'd otherwise miss. Uh, very easily because it just triggers randomly on, on NPCs like that as they go about their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, so here we get this area which I also found rather interesting but without a mount that can jump very high there's not too much I think that we can do. Uh, again I, I feel like it's been stripped of some of its content. I could imagine a heart being available here but there's very little uh, to play around with on the demo. Maybe story takes us here at some point. I love the design and sort of, you know, the rugged kind of metallic structures we got here. Feels very char-based, actually, and quite uh, technologically advanced for what I'd expect in the desert. Assistant Chief's toolbox. What if it bites her? I made sure it was dead first. I want to scare her, not kill her. <laughs> okay. And uh, maybe sometimes there's not big conspiracies. It's just people joshing around. Moving east now. Uh, similar to how this uh, whole thing started with me scraping the northern wall. We're now scraping the southern wall. And we get some more details here. Outlander, learn of King Joko, bringer of peace. This is an interesting one. This is one of the very few places... No, sorry. I take that back. This is the only place you can actually fight the Awakened. Uh, in the demo. So the Awakened are a big faction. There'll be a lot to do in the expansion. Um, but they only appear here on this map. So they're definitely more of a late game enemy. Uh, and this is uh, a little bit of their voice acting we get there. The enemy themselves actually says summons tar to slow foes. And a lot of the Awakened have got kind of this tar design on them. They've got like tar hanging from their arms and their legs. I'm not sure what's going on there. Uh, but look, he's even got this guy assisting him. And you hear they love Joko. Everybody loves Joko. Humans and undead alike. Your kingdom, your majesty. We'll do anything to return to your good graces. We were wrong to ever leave Alona. 
And so here you hear a bunch of these refugees, these disillusioned refugees. These are people from far down to the south, from Alona itself. Remember, we're not in Alona yet. We're only in the Crystal Desert. And the story very is very careful to make that clear and talks about that a lot. Something I've actually very much enjoyed. Uh, but the idea is that all the humans there now worship and love their sort of tyrannical uh, dictator leader, uh, Palawa Joko, who conquered them. And they all love him now. And some of them decide, oh, I'm going to leave and try and make a new life for myself. And now there's some disillusioned ones that are returning again. Again, you know that their, their their mindset with regard to how they revere Joko is that warped, and I think it's uh, pretty fascinating. I really like the idea of that and where the expansion might be going in terms of telling stories like that. We're gonna have a blatant villain, but that a lot of characters and humans we're supposed to be sympathetic to uh, don't see as a villain themselves. This is the command. Thank you for contacting Chinese Dragon Lab. No one's available to respond at this time. Please try again later. Uh, there's an example of the story thing I was talking about earlier. Uh, this is one of the high ground places we can press F and get some detail from Timey. Now, if I pressed F again, we could have triggered some slightly different dialogue, but uh, that's about it. Again, I'm expecting that to be a mainstay in the story, and we'll see a lot of it, but who knows. We've got a sand-worn wreckage uh, as a rare from our, our kill there. Uh, here, I've only got a raptor as a mount, right? But I want to climb, and I'm finding this so often. I want to climb, I want to climb, I want to climb, and it's just not easy to climb. You know, I do all this struggling to get up, and I'll cut it out there, but later, if I get a different mount... I'll just be able to, you know, uh, jump and then I'll be done nice and comfortably. But here you'll notice there's content up here. You know, if this was other Guild Wars 2 maps, you wouldn't expect there to be anything. But they took the time to put some enemies and uh, I appreciate that. Continuing along the southern wall, we're back into daytime now. And uh, you get to see how brilliantly different and drastically uh, contrasting to the night that it is. Uh, and again, I really appreciate that. I think post-processing on this map is some of the best that they've ever done. Uh, but now we're going to come into a little village area. Um, another place that we can't really uh, go without a longer raptor leap. Uh, involving a script who's been pushed out of his home by lots of angry birds. Uh, that's quite funny. Here's another priestess of Cormier. Uh, who is helping out more refugees. I think there's got to be a thing to run around and get all of these supplies for all of these lovely ladies. There is a small farm just down the cliff nearby where you get the special action ability during the certain dynamic events that allow you to whip and corral these Doliac as they escape from their, from their pens. Uh, and that's quite fun. Here we got these chickens! I love what they're doing with the chickens here. Those who follow the developer live streams will remember that when one of the raid wings came out in this game recently, they put rats in the raid wing that get feared and run away from you when you walk near them. And they said, oh, we'll try and use this in other areas as is appropriate. You just saw that there on the ground with those chickens. Those chickens run away from us when we uh, walk near them on our raptor. I think a really cool detail would be what if the chickens weren't scared of us when we were just on our feet, but when we mount, the chickens are scared of the raptor and they run away in that situation. That'd be interesting. Uh, I wish actually in the demo and the stress test and stuff I'd spent a bit more time at that building because I really spent very 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 little uh, and maybe there was some cool NPCs and things to learn. Uh, around here I think we just got some small narrow canyons very reminiscent of the desert borderlands from world versus world uh, and here you can see there's a broken drawbridge above us actually right now and that is where there's this script who's been pushed out of some uh, little beautiful actual temp uh, old ruined temple uh, very reminiscent of what we saw earlier with those fire jinn being just out of range right and we desperately want to be able to jump we desperately want to be able to make it across the gap but it's just not going to be feasible uh, that won't stop me from trying to climb around again what does it always seem to be that when I'm exploring Guild Wars 2 I end up trying to like do jammy make bre break outy things that sort of undermine the point of everything. I suppose when the expansion is actually out and I know I'll just be able to get the Springer very quickly, I won't put so much effort into this silly nonsense. But hey, how about we go ahead and cheekily cut to when we made it up. Uh, so here you got this cool pillar that's crossing that gap. That reminds me a lot of a Guild Wars 1 section of the Nightfall storyline where you deliberately knock one of those down. Uh, the sort of solitary colossus. But yeah, so we got this script. He says, no, no, don't let them get to me. And she says, sand fishy's bad, but bad birds worse. Worse bad, bad, bad birds. Birds? I don't see any birds. The cave! Broken bridge! And uh, we can't go in there, but it is absolutely gorgeous. It really is. When I eventually did later, um, truly fascinating. And I'm looking forward to seeing uh, my proper exploration of that once the expansion itself is uh, out. Another prairie dog over on that cliff to the side. We've got these paracels as well. They've been used a lot. Uh, you can find them on top of pyramids. You can find them out on beaches. You can find them here. I mean, even a squirt is hiding in the shade of one of these paracels. I must admit, I just look at that and hope that it will be a guild decoration 
In fact, that often goes through my mind when I see the new stuff that they're adding. Is that going to be a guild decoration? Is that? Is that? Is that? Continuing the adventure, scraping steadily along the south, you come to this path. Uh, there's some uh, of very interesting areas you can see off in the distance there, but once again, we're at the demo border now. This was also a place that you could break out of the map for what it's worth by deliberately walking into the demo boundary and then logging out and back in. And for whatever reason, if you were stood at the right place after doing that, it would drop you through the floor. And I actually had people messaging me about this technique maybe half an hour to 40 minutes after the damn thing had started. So it really was very quick. Uh, but all I really do on the footage here at this point is kill these eels. There's also a torch we can interact with on the right. I like the idea of this expansion having more super dark zones. I've always enjoyed those in Guild Wars 2 where you've got to carry a light source to see. We see that in the World vs. World Obsidian Sanctum jumping puzzle. There's a mini dungeon in Dredgehog Cliffs that does it. I'd like the idea of more of that. Half on did it a little bit. There was one area of Tangled Depths that was super dark. Uh, but then they didn't do too much more after that. And I think that was always a bit of a shame. Here you're getting a bit more of that taste of, oh, I'm in combat, damn, I can't mount, right? I want to get out of combat, I want to run away, but these enemies have just managed to hit me. So what you will have noticed there is I was just spamming the mount button. Please let me mount, please let me mount, please let me mount, and then finally I can. I think a lot of us are going to uh, experience that as we go forwards. It will kind of be the new version of trying to waypoint, but you're still in combat and you're just hoping to break. Uh, except maybe um, slightly less irritating than all of that. Uh, so moving around we're still very close to where we were a second ago. There's this little outpost I'm not sure I really have anything prescient to say about it uh, Except that there's I think a ranger pet or something interesting going on in the water. What was it? Yeah, there's a, a dolphin is it in the in the water called Nanshi, I think uh, or maybe a new variety of creature. I'm pretty sure there are some plants that you can fight. I still haven't done any of these on this little playthrough that I'm showing you guys here on YouTube. Uh, here we go, fanged bogus. So we can fight some of these. Um, and uh, these are actually available for rangers to capture. Oh, I guess that they're actually out of demo range and I'm not going to fight those ones. Here we go. Let's do, let's grab one of them. There's the game's teleporting me a bit weirdly. So I really wanted to see what kind of abilities these guys would use because they're classic Guild Wars 1 creatures and it's excellent to see them come back. Uh, here they paint the ground with all of this nasty goop and uh, we get a debuff on us. Uh, we start hallucinating. Uh, hallucination is something that we saw back in Living World Season 1 and they didn't really do much with since. So while you're hallucinating... Uh, it will spawn random things around you um, that appear to be threats, but they're not really. And uh, so that, like that spider that just dropped down there. This is very similar to the toxic hallucinations we'd get from the, um, the Toxic Alliance way back in Season 1. And we get that on these plants again. That's nice. As a ranger... Getting in a bogger as a pet, you won't be able to make your enemies hallucinate and spawn random little spiders and stuff. But uh, at least when we as players are fighting against them, that's a thing. Here the demo boundary seemed a bit poorly placed and a bit arbitrary. It meant that I couldn't walk up onto that wall to get around, which is annoying because it was right near that staircase. So instead we have to come this way. There you saw my raptor climbing a staircase and getting stuck a little bit as it moves. That's one of the little movement bugs that I think a lot of people talked about when the demo came out. And uh, I hope will be improved once the actual uh, release lands and will be a thing of the past. But yeah, when you're on a raptor and you're trying to go up any kind of like gradient that's slightly too steep, uh, he'll get really tricked out and buggy and weird. Uh, it's not a big deal because you can just stop and press the jump key and you'll go up. But it would be uh, a lot smoother if those little moments didn't happen. So here we're kind of in the bottom right of the demo area. But you'll notice that Alona Reach is just to the side again. Uh, that we're getting closer to the uh, Temple of Cormir. And this is sort of the perimeter complete now at this point. Uh, I think I noticed something up on that cliff, but can't quite tell what or what was so interesting about it uh which re means that really the last thing for us to do more bleach bones here uh the last thing for us to do is to check out the central areas the central area is uh sort of a farm based area i guess i was too far away from those bones to get them uh, and it's where we find the uh the hollow smith who talks a little bit about the zephyrites and we get a cool event to throw some sand sharks into uh a sand pit uh, more eels coming out of nowhere and attacking me. I guess, is it designed such that when you pick up bleach bones, eels attack you? Maybe that's what they're doing? But again, I'm in combat, just desperately trying to mount up again so I can move on. Oh, here we fall into this trench, which I could have easily jumped. And uh, we notice that there's these traps. We got a veteran forged assembler here. This is the purpley looking one. 
uh, that reminded me of Marganites in some of the initial trailers. You actually notice I take quite a lot of damage from that trap there too. As I don't pay attention to it while I'm fighting. It was nice to play Dagger Dagger in the demo as well. This has really got nothing to do with the, uh, the expansion itself. But it was nice to be able to go back to this and experience this weapon set. Which I've spent so little time on since I've just been mostly using Warhorn for the past two years. And also, obviously, we just had a big balance patch when the demo came out. Uh, which had added stuff like quickness on Lightning Hammer and changed the way the fall worked. So we kind of got to experience this demo with a lot of fun stuff that the new balance patch had given us. And it really was quite a good one. So here I'm trying to find out a way to get out of the trench. And this is going to take me uh, a little bit more central. And this is kind of our tour winding down now, guys. At this point, this was uh, the first stuff I did before I, I went off. Uh, there was obviously a lot of other things to see. And especially when you started doing map breakouts. But generally, this is about when it started capping out for content. This was about the moment where I started to realize, okay, I've experienced everything that the demo has. And it did worry me a little bit that, you know, it, it felt it had come and gone so fast. But now that you've seen firsthand how long it took me to hit this point, I'm wondering what about for you guys? Uh, did you have something similar? Did you play a lot slower than I did? Certainly for this early stuff, I did very little in the city. And the city itself has lots of dialogue, lots of NPCs. Uh, certainly here I've been very sporadic with the vistas and stuff that I've claimed. And it was only later that I went back and uh, was a lot more completionist about it and got a lot more hours. But uh, this was sort of uh, what it took for me to get a gist of the area. So here we've got an event where uh, there's these sand pups. What you're supposed to do is CC them, then you can pick them up, and then you can throw them into this pit. It's a nice example, I think, of how the dynamic events have improved in the game these days. Uh, this is so much more involved than, you know, a simple little escort. And of course, by the way, on our raptor, we can use the raptor skill 1 to jump at a ton of pups, knock them out of the sand, and then quickly pick them up. But yeah, so here I run into the pit, use the skill 1, and you can throw it into that area. In truth, I didn't really have to stand as close as I did there. Uh, you can do it from some reasonable range. Uh, but yeah, a nice event. Takes quite a while to do, so I'll just cut out the, the main bulk of it. Uh, but there you have it, and we can help them recover all of their pups, and their pups are safe. It's nice to see humans sort of herding these new uh, enemies and sort of seeing how they affect the people in those areas of the world. I think if you're going to add a new enemy and a new variety, you know, a new creature, it's nice to see how various uh, people interact with it out in the desert. And, uh, and so, yeah, I think that's most of what I showed off. Uh, maybe I do the hero challenge in the area in a second. So there is a hero challenge. There's also a collection to get all of those Elonian uh, weapons, by the way, like that hammer there. I think you've seen three on this playthrough. Uh, it's a bottle out in the middle of the desert, and out of it does come a gin. So the demo had two varieties of gin. It had the fire gin, which you had to be a bit cheaty to get out and fight and see. There's a juvenile sand lion that we could tame as a, as a ranger. But also, it has a single water gin. Now, the only way to find and fight the water gin is to come over to this bottle, interact with it, and uh, the gin will pop out. So it says somehow this bottle survived. And uh, here he is in the fight. Uh, unfortunately, the fight ended so fast, I can't quite tell what all of his special abilities are. He does have a break bar, at least. Uh, but it, almost as soon as you shatter that, then the boss itself kind of dies. It's, it feels like there's a lot of blinds, but that's mostly that sand lion that's also deciding to try and fight at the same time. And uh, it's got some pretty cool dialogue as well. I'm free, but the world's magic, something strange. The stir attends my whims. It's interesting. They don't like the way that magic is working these days. Jin in the lore are very magical entities, right? And uh, seeing them be so uh, worried about the state of Tyria right now is interesting. They say the magic here is unstable and I'm returning to my bottle, never to be seen again. Go away, there's something wrong with the magic in this world. Ooh, uh, little things like that make me think maybe we'll get some good information from the gin in the X-Pack, but we will see. And there you go, guys. That is the demo. That's a bit of a playthrough, a run-through. I did want to be a bit more um, exhaustive about my coverage of it and show you more specifics. I hope you enjoyed this format. Let me know if you did. And uh, I guess I will see you for more stuff similar and details on Path of Fire very soon. If you enjoyed this, guys, there's lots of links in the description, including the ability to pick up the X-Pack for yourself and check out some of the other things I've done. Let me know what you think, everyone. It would really mean a lot to me, and I guess I will see you next time. Cheers, everyone.